Welcome to Get Sleepy, the podcast where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. My name is Tom, and I'm your host. Thank you for tuning in. Tonight, I'm delighted to say that Simon is back to read our story, and I can't wait for you to hear this mystical tale. We've all heard of certain creatures that are supposed to exist only in legends and tall tales. They're often presented as sinister characters, with spiky tails or sharp teeth, so it's no wonder we often fear them. But what if these fabled creatures have been misunderstood all along? What if they aren't so bad after all? Tonight, we'll venture to a secret garden where all kinds of mythical creatures live together in harmony. It's time now to leave the day behind, to let go of any desire to problem solve or concern yourself with what's been and gone. Just Settle into your bed, making sure you're comfortable so that you can relax and enjoy our story. Take a deep breath in, filling up your lungs, and gently breathe back out. On your next inhale, Just tell yourself that you're breathing in the essence of calm. And as you exhale, you're releasing any disruptive thoughts or feelings. Breathing calm. Let go of tension. That essence of calm can filter through every cell of your body. And as you release tension and worry, those negative energies leave your body and mind, dissipating into the outer world. Continue to breathe in calm and release any last bits of tension for as long as you'd like. Eventually, all you'll be left with is pure serenity. I'll hand over to Simon for our story now. We begin in a forest A beautiful one, no doubt, but one that has something unusual about it, something enchanted. Let's head there now and discover the unique creatures that call this garden home. Deep within a magical forest, whose lush undergrowth is dotted with bright green ferns and purple asters, mythical creatures live out their days. They have a home in a secret garden among fragrant flowers and magnificent trees. The entrance to the garden is hidden behind a giant curtain of swaying ivy. Here. Tall blades of grass cling to the moss-covered ground, growing taller and taller until they become a canopy of their own. This makes it nearly impossible to find the arched gateway leading to the secret garden, which is just how the creatures like it. 
But despite their efforts to remain hidden, adventurers and explorers have passed through the garden gates now and then. They are lured by its legend and manage to outwit the mythical creature in charge of guarding the entrance. The Sphinx of the Secret Garden has the head of a cat, the sprawling wings of a falcon, and the body and tail of a lion. Its eyes are bulbous, with golden-brown irises and almond-shaped pupils as black as night. Its sharp teeth and claws are meant to ward off trespassers. But this sphinx wouldn't hurt a fly. Its docile nature and kind eyes hide the fact that it could cast spells to make humans forget their names, if it wanted to. The Sphinx is one of the first mythical creatures to be recorded in the forest bestiary. This leather-bound book with gold cursive writing on the cover is kept in a glass bell jar on a stone pedestal in the Rose Garden. It catalogues the different creatures that live here, when they arrived, what their abilities are, and what jobs they have now. The Sphinx's job is Guardian of the Gate. Behind the cascading wall of ivy, the arched gate is festooned with pink and white flowers, shaped like little hearts. The gate is made of wrought iron, welded into ornate shapes. It's covered in intricate patterns, depicting a fairy tale scene of rabbits, foxes and deer frolicking among twisted vines and flowers. While guarding the gate, the Sphinx lies down in its favorite position, flat on its belly with its front legs stretched forward and its hind legs bent at its sides. When it's feeling bored, which happens a lot, the Sphinx licks its paws, stretches, or sleeps until it's roused by one of the garden gnomes. Now, the gnomes of the secret garden may be tiny in size, but here, a day in the life of a gnome is no small feat. These little gardeners, with their weathered skin, white beards and conical hats, are the keepers of the secret garden. They occupy a small hamlet on the other side of the gate, filled with oval flower beds and soaring evergreens. They live in hollows at the base of the trees, and they spend their off time knitting chunky sweaters and socks with yarn that they spin from bamboo grass. The gnomes work hard to ensure that their beloved garden thrives. This includes supervising mythical creatures that pretend to be hard at work, but are in fact not. The pixies have a particular tendency to laze about instead of working. These elf-like creatures live in a nearby meadow where larkspurs shine like blue stars under the sun. Pixies may look a bit like fairies, but they have pointy ears and four elongated wings like dragonflies. As the garden assessors, the pixies hover over the meadow with tiny clipboards in hand. They report to the gnomes on the quality of the nectar that the bees of the secret garden love to drink. But, oftentimes, pixies ignore their duties. Instead, they go foraging for blackberries that grow in the bushes near the cherry blossoms. The cherry blossom field is a pink wonderland, with thousands of petals falling from mature cherry trees. They blanket the forest floor in a sea of pink. 
This enchanting place is home to the Kitsune. In her natural form, this wily creature looks like a fox with long, thin legs, a pointed nose, and a white coat that glistens in the sunlight. But sometimes, she shapeshifts into other forms. Occasionally, she pretends to be a gnome, which the real gnomes find quite annoying. The Kitsune is one of the oldest creatures in the forest. Her kind can grow up to nine bushy tails over the course of their lives. At the moment, she has seven tails in all colors of the rainbow which means she's lived for a very long time. But she prefers not to discuss her age. She carries her soul in a round gemstone that radiates a warm yellow light. This is her source of life and magic. She keeps hers buried in her bushiest tail and is always careful not to misplace it. When she shapeshifts into other creatures, she wears it on a white leather collar studded with tiny gold stars. One of her favorite forms is a panda, whose fur matches the collar nicely. When she's in her natural form, she enjoys whiling away the hours underneath the cherry blossoms, grooming herself as pink petals fall from the trees like snowflakes. Two centaurs also live in the garden. They love to stroll through the cherry blossoms in the early morning when most of the flora is covered in dew. These half-humans, half-horses are brother and sister, but they couldn't be any more different from each other in appearance. Bo, the brother, is seven feet tall. He has the lustrous mane of a black stallion, olive skin, and hazel eyes. Bev, the sister, is slightly shorter at six feet. She has a fair complexion with rosy cheeks and aquamarine eyes. Her mane is platinum blonde, and she wears it in a long, thick braid that falls to her knees. Bo and Bev have an important job to do. They are tasked with quietly escorting unexpected visitors back to the arched gate, so that the Sphinx can erase their memories of the secret garden. Then they watch as the visitors leave through the curtain of swaying ivy. Bo and Bev don't get to do their job frequently, given how rare unexpected visitors are. But they take it seriously nonetheless, in part because the centaurs are best friends with the gnomes. According to the gnomes, intruders pose a great challenge for the garden, especially humans, for humans cause all sorts of calamities. They pick golden flowers with no regard for the gentle ogres that prune them. They also trample beds of red poppies and pink tulips kept by the garden's minotaur. The minotaur is a tall, bull-headed man with a long brown tail who wields a silver axe. He works hard to grow and maintain his flowers over the years and sighs deeply when others walk on them. The gnomes can't believe that some of their mythical friends are related to humans. But those creatures understand. They know that most humans are just curious and mean no harm. Some gnomes wonder if the docile sphinx guarding the gate should be reassigned to a different job. 
Perhaps the Minotaur himself could prevent more outsiders from entering the garden, they wonder. To discuss the issue, the gnomes formed a council of elders that sometimes meets in a round clearing in the middle of a field of daisies. On this particular day, they are going over the question of the Sphinx and its job once again. One of the gnomes, who wears her pointy hat so far down her head it covers her eyes, says that the Sphinx is no longer suited to the role of gate guardian. Her white dress, yellow belt, and green hat match the colors of the daisy field perfectly. This makes some of the gnomes wonder whether her choice of clothing is more than just a happy coincidence. The gnome in the white dress says that humans have started to figure out how to deal with the sphinxes. They know the creatures can't resist the urge to tell riddles. So they strike a deal, passage into the garden in exchange for solving one. However, the gnome who presides over the council has a different opinion. He says that perhaps the solution isn't to relieve the Sphinx of duty, but to equip it with harder riddles to solve. Real head-scratchers that even the smartest humans won't be able to figure out. But when the gnome in the white dress asks for an example, the head gnome furrows his brow. He doesn't know how to come up with tricky rhymes that will stump the smartest humans and keep them from entering the garden. I'll give it a shot. There's a gnome in a blue tunic and black hat who strokes his long beard. I am black of eye and bright of hair, he says, and my feet are firmly in the ground. I love the sun upon my face, and I follow it around. What am I? The gnomes shake their heads. A sunflower, they say in unison. The riddle is too easy. After careful consideration, the gnomes realize that their knowledge is too deeply rooted in gardening and that humans will always guess their riddles. Best to leave the Sphinx where it is at the gate, says the head gnome. All things considered, the Sphinx is the most skilled at dealing with the humans whose curiosity lures them deep into the magic forest. Besides, it's the only mythical creature that can cast a spell to make the humans forget their visit if it needs to. With the case closed, the gnomes return to their hollows under the trees or to their garden plots. When the kitsune isn't spending time underneath the cherry blossoms, she does her job as the garden messenger, delivering the gnome's instructions to other mythical creatures. Her first stop is the topiary garden, where a chimera spends his days sculpting dense green bushes into ornamental shapes. The chimera is arguably the most skilled gardener of all, which might be surprising. That's because he has three heads. One is a goat's head, the other is a lion's head, and the last is a snake's. And each has its own opinion. But the one hobby they all enjoy is gardening. When it's time to flex his green thumb, his three heads work as a team without any disagreement. And as three heads are better than one, he's able to make magnificent creations 
using all of his own creative ideas. He grows tall boxwoods in different shades of green, which he sculpts into fantastical topiaries, using pruners, shears, and loppers that look like giant scissors. He can sculpt almost anything the imagination dares to dream. From standalone bushes, he carves pensive gargoyles, hunched over with their fists on their chins, deep in thought. From wide hedges, he sculpts happy trolls with long, bushy hair standing on end. His creations pay tribute to other mythical creatures that live in the secret garden. One of them is the giant serpent Ouroboros. Its job is to cultivate the land for new crops, which it does by plowing acres of soil with its teeth. Chimera sculpts his serpent friend in the shape of a ring, with its mouth biting its tail. Next to the snake is a phoenix, a majestic bird with scarlet and gold plumage and a blue crest that flows from its head like a bridal train. He sculpts the phoenix topiary from a honeysuckle bush that has red blooms shaped like firecrackers and little golden flowers like sleigh bells. The decision to portray this fiery bird with red and yellow blooms makes sense, given the phoenix's tendency to burst into flames. Another sensible choice is to sculpt the phoenix next to the serpent, given the time-worn rivalry between these two mythical creatures on the issue of immortality. According to the serpent, there is only room in the garden for one creature that symbolizes an eternal cycle of rebirth. A beginning, end, and new beginning, over and over again. The phoenix agrees, having risen from its own ashes plenty of times. But the phoenix does not concede the title of best immortal creature to the serpent. In fact, the bird claims seniority as far as mythology is concerned. But the truth is, no one knows which of the two came first. Their origin stories have been lost to time. Or perhaps the tales were lost in a fire. According to the phoenix, it once had in its possession an ancient scroll made of papyrus that settled the score as to which creature was older than the other. Papyrus, tea-stained in appearance, is extracted from the stem of the grassy plant that grows along the banks of the Nile River. It's used to make paper, among other things. According to the phoenix, the papyrus scroll detailed how, and most importantly, when it was born. When the Council of Elder Gnomes convened to discuss the issue of best immortal creature, they asked the phoenix to produce this document. But the crestfallen bird confessed to the Council that it had burned the scroll to a crisp long ago, when it had a disagreement with a griffin. The griffin, who was once friendly with the phoenix, had declared itself best mythical bird of all time. And this played on the last ounce of patience the phoenix had. It couldn't contain the fire that rose within, and so it burst into flames, accidentally burning the scroll it held in its talons. How could a griffin 
think itself a better bird than a phoenix. After all, griffins are a mix of an eagle and a lion. So they're not even entirely a bird. Of course, they are very smart, the phoenix told the council. Their intelligence is a character trait they wear proudly on their eagle faces. They're strong, too, with the muscular body of a lion and sharp talons. But this does not a great bird make, the phoenix said. A phoenix can live forever after all. What could possibly be greater than that? What about a serpent that can live forever? said the head gnome during the council meeting. He pointed at the Ouroboros that had been quietly circling the gathered group. And so, with proof of its origin lost in a flame of its own creation, the phoenix agreed to share the title of best immortal creature with the serpent. But only as long as the Council of Gnomes agreed that the mighty phoenix was a better bird than the griffin. All right, said the Council of Gnomes, and the case was closed. At nightfall, most of the creatures wind down after a hard day's work in the secret garden. This is what is happening now that the sun has set beyond the trees of the magic forest. But two of them are just beginning the late shift. Emir, the frost giant, emerges from his dark cave when the vast sweep of the sky turns black and becomes dotted with millions of stars. This colossal giant's body is made of dark blue ice, multifaceted like a finely cut diamond. He has two icy blue horns, glowing eyes, and a beard made of sparkling white icicles. He carries a gold and silver sledgehammer that he often uses to clear the land for new seedlings. Emir's cave is in the garden's core. It's located in a modest mountain whose lone summit rises above the forest canopy ever so slightly. It's the perfect spot for him to fulfill his duty as a senior irrigation specialist. He takes great pride in his title. Standing at the top of the mountain, the frost giant takes a deep breath. When he exhales, cool, misty air flows out across the land. He sends thousands of tiny ice particles in all directions, coating the topiary garden, the cherry blossom field, and flower beds bristling with lupins that look like blue corn. Emir's breath also blankets the intricate garden maze made with winding hedges that the centaurs can successfully navigate blindfolded. It's one of their favorite games. His breath aids the morning dew. It keeps the soil moist overnight until the sun rises to warm up the plants, flowers and trees in the garden. Sometimes, it's a bit too cold. When this happens, many flower and vegetable beds are at risk of freezing over. This is where the frost giant's loyal, four-legged friend comes in. The Cerberus of the Secret Garden is a happy, three-headed, fire-breathing dog with kind blue eyes, a short grey coat, and a spiky dragon's tail. Back in the day, 
Cerberus used to guard the gates of the underworld. But now, he lives up to his title as the official warmer of the garden. Every night, he pads quietly through the plants, sniffing out sections of the garden that run the risk of freezing. When he finds one, he lies down in it, curls up, and emanates such warmth that all of the plants, flowers, and groves within a mile spring back into life, revived from their icy slumber. On nights when Cerberus doesn't need to warm up the soil, he pays a visit to the Sphinx at the garden gate, walking softly on all fours so as not to disturb the little gnomes who are fast asleep. Cerberus and the Sphinx became fast friends over their mutual interest in guarding things. After all, the three-headed dog knows a thing or two about security, having guarded the gates of the underworld for thousands of years. The two friends chat while lying under the arched gate. At this time of night, the red flowers above them are greyed over by the moonlight. The Sphinx lies in repose in its favourite position, with its front legs stretched forward and its hind legs bent at its sides. Then it speaks a new riddle that's currently taking shape in its mind. I sound like a place where roses and daisies could go to sleep, it says. It is not humans who count sheep here, but dandelions, daffodils, and mythical creatures like you and me. What am I? Cerberus grins. A flower bed, he says. As the two friends talk late into the night, the secret garden beyond the gate sleeps soundly under the starry sky. In it, happy little gnomes are tucked into their beds. They dream of white lilies, babbling brooks, and friendly mythical creatures resting under the light of a beautiful moon. <laughs>